on behalf of Fiki West Bengal State Council, I am delighted to welcome all the participants today to this uh, fantastic event. Uh, we already have uh, almost 100 people joined and we will have 250 people join. Uh, this is the first of the India at 75 lecture series that Fiki is organizing. Uh, West Bengal State Council will be organizing three uh, lecture series, starting with today, with Dr. Andrew White. We have two others. Um, uh, we have CDC's Asia Head, uh, Commonwealth Development Corporation, and Premji Invest's uh, Managing Director, uh, TK Kurian and Srini Nagarajan. Uh, speaking in the second and third lecture. Uh, but the first lecture, we are very, very pleased and proud to have Dr. Andrew White. Uh, he heads the Advanced Management and Leadership Program at Oxford University and is an authority on purpose of business. When we talk of purpose of business, um, we have various leaders in different positions. I remember reading Milton Friedman, a Nobel laureate in economics, say the purpose of business is to turn a profit. And we have in the Fikis, in Fikis fourth annual general meeting, Mahatma Gandhi said that industry is a trustee of people's wealth. And thus, the purpose of business is to take care of people. So where do we fall? The question is most relevant today. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of FICI, it's just a, an honor to be here, an honor to talk about what I think is going to be a really important topic, not just today, but ever increasingly important going forward. I'd also like to say happy birthday to India. Um, I understand that it was 75 years since independence um, two days ago. Um, so it's also wonderful to be here at such an auspicious time as well for you all. So as Rudra says, my work is very much focused on researching the things that are going on at the very top of companies um, and the topics that senior leaders are having to wrestle with. So today I want to take you through a short presentation I've entitled Profit for Purpose. This comes from a number of different um, bits of research that I've done, interviews I've done with senior leaders. I'm also gonna be giving you some tools. Um, so this isn't just about giving you feedback. I'm gonna be giving you some ways to think about this, some things that you can take back either to use yourself as a leader or use with your boards. So if I could take you to the first slide. And I want to take you back to 2015. And I was at the World Economic Forum at Davos. And I was interviewing CEOs about what was going on in their businesses um, and really how they saw the future. And I had a conversation that will stay with me for a long time. And it went something like this. The CEO said to me, for the last 30 years, it's as though I've been climbing a mountain. And that mountain has been my own career. It's been the company and it's been the industry that we are part of. And if I'm really honest, today, it seems like I'm stood on top of the mountain. I'm surrounded by clouds and fog. I can't see which direction to go in. And it feels like the ground beneath me is starting to break away. And I thought to myself, wow, that's strong language to use. This wasn't a company that was in crisis. Um, there wasn't a regulatory issue. There wasn't a shareholder issue. But he started to speak to something that I thought could be really important. So I relayed this story to others and to a person over the last seven years, six years, nobody has disagreed with me. In fact, for me, it's become a very interesting way to think about where companies are at, where leaders are at. So if I take us forward, what we can start to see is that many companies have been built over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, sometimes even longer. Um, there's companies that I know that have been in existence for over 100 and some over 200 years. 
But it seems like there are a number of, let's call them clouds, storms that are on the, not just on the horizon, but in, for some businesses, very, very present. Whether that's climate change, whether that's competitors, new competitors, but old competitors as well. The fourth industrial revolution, regulators that are increasingly interventionist. And we are seeing this in China at the moment. We've seen this in the, in the London markets, in the New York markets post the financial crisis. And I'll come on and talk about that in a moment. And consumers who've got much more voice through things like social media. So for many companies, they are having to think about or in the, are in the midst of going through massive structural change. And that change can either be an abyss, a, a kind of a black hole that they fall into, or it's a place of transformation that they move through. And as, as Rudra said, this has just been accelerated. It's been deepened over the last 18 months because of COVID. And we've seen COVID force changes into how we work. I'm working out of an office in my house in Oxfordshire, not out of one of the wonderful buildings that you can see behind me. Um, uh, many of you will be in your homes. Um, some of you will be back in the office, but not full time. It's also seen changes to the way in which we distribute products um, and the whole digitization agenda as well. So let me take you back to 2008 in the financial crisis. And a number of companies realized that they couldn't just exist for profiteering. They couldn't just exist to simply focus on their bottom line. Um, and particularly the banks were forced to think about their role in society. And we saw this when in certain economies, government stepped in to stop banks from failing because they were too important. So the whole conversation around purpose started to emerge then. And if anything, it just got stronger and stronger uh, and it's been driven deeper into organizations. And we did a lot of work on this and we define purpose as an aspirational reason for being, which inspires and provides a call to action for an organization, its partners and stakeholders and provides benefit to local and global society. So it's aspirational. It's about why we exist. It's a call to action. Um, and it's for all parts of the organization, both those who are you know, employed, but also the partners as well. And it's about impact. It's about the role that company plays in society and beyond. So let me take you through what I think are five major paradoxes and, and a paradox for those of you who are not familiar with the term is where you have two competing ideas. And I think these are the paradoxes or these are the things which many senior leaders are wrestling with today, even though they may not see that in the, in, in the short term. So the first is what I call the psychological paradox. So for, Len for millennia, most of us have had to struggle for existence. Um, and we've always lived with this deep sense of not having enough. So the question is, has this left the legacy in our subconscious where we continually need to acquire? And when I'll come on to the implications of this, both for our mental health, for the performance of companies, but also for the Earth's resources that we are drawing on. The second is what I call the innovation paradox. Um, and when we can look at companies today, particularly large successful companies, they can become trapped by the power of that success and multiple bits of research confirm this. So it's very difficult for them to reinvent themselves. And many of these large companies are running products and services, not all, but many of which were created for the 20th century, not the 21st century. Then there's the profit and growth paradox and the profit and growth paradox is when you're creating profit when you're growing it's very hard to say what is enough and what is the right size for us and when you have a business model that's heavily dependent on natural resources and creates a lot of waste um, how do you change that very very difficult for large companies to do we then go on to what we call the resource paradox and when we look at business we look at business in the USA, in China, in where you are in India. I don't think there's been a better model for bringing people out of poverty and keeping people out of poverty. Um, but at the same time, there's been a major cost to the environment. So how do we disconnect these two things? 
because I think if, as a society, we need to bring and keep more and more people out of poverty. But at the same time, we have to recognize that that economic growth cannot come from um, excessive use or damaging use of, of the Earth's resources. And then the spiritual paradox, and I think this is perhaps the hardest to define, how do we value the sanctity of all life as we produce and consume without a common set of values and a religious framework through which to do so? And I say that with a deep sense of consciousness or understanding that this plays out differently in different societies. Um, you've got almost a post-religion society where I am in the UK that is different in different parts of the world. But nevertheless, what are these common values that we all hold to? So fundamentally, this raises a question. Why does your company exist? Is it for profit? Is it for employees? Is it for customers? Or is it for society and the planet? And my sense is that these things used to be in quite a simple to understand hierarchy. But in many cases now, these things are being challenged and senior leaders are having to review how these things work together, how they interact, and how the paradoxes that I present can be overcome. So we came up with what we call 10 principles of purpose activation. Purpose is really when you get to why we exist, what we exist for, who we exist for. It, it's, it's a conversation that takes you away simply from executing the existing business model. And it starts to ask questions of why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Who are we impacting and how does that need to change? So purpose, if you're going to activate this and bring this into your organization, the first thing is it's a it's not a start. It's not it's a starting point. It's not the finishing point. And this needs to be embedded into decision making, into both culture and strategy. It's how you operate the business. You need to measure it. But like many organizations, don't over measure it. It's not CSR. It's not just about how you have a little organized part of the organization that relates to society. It's about the core of the business. It's not a to-do list, but it's very much a North Star. You bring it to life with stories, and I'm going to talk more about how you do that. Um, you lean on purpose in good times as well as hard times, and many companies had to discover purpose when things weren't good. Um, it's not always a win-win, um, and sometimes you have to make difficult decisions. And you have to celebrate successes and acknowledge shortcomings. So that's really a, a list of the principles. I'm going to go in and talk about how we bring these things to life. So what I said at the beginning was I was going to give you tools and I was going to give you methodologies to how you bring this into your organization. And, and this is the first one that I want to talk about. And I call it the purpose pendulum. So if you think about your organization and you think about stories, stories of how you impact employees, stories of how you impact customers, you can probably come up with five stories of where you feel you're on purpose, where once you've identified that aspirational reason for being, you can find stories in your organization of where you really hit that, where you really deliver that, where the board, where the directors, where the employees are proud. You probably also have five stories of where you're off purpose. And, and like a pendulum that swings, your organization moves between these two things. And these are often events, they're situations, um, and they're things that you recognize in how you operate. And frankly, the challenge is how to do more of the things of where you are on purpose and how to do more of the things where you're off purpose. This can be an incredibly motivating exercise to go through. And it's a really interesting tool and simple tool to use with large numbers of employee of employees to get their sense of where are we really on purpose and where are we off purpose. So the first tool is really the purpose pendulum. The second tool is a structure that I've used with boards and with groups of CEOs, and it's asking difficult questions. And I, I recently had a paper published in Harvard Business Review, the link of which is at the bottom of the slide. So if you Google 10 proactive questions every board member should be asking, you'll find, um, you'll find that paper. But there's two questions which I often use with groups of senior leaders. The first one is, 
What are you not talking about that you need to talk about? What are you not talking about that you need to talk about? And interestingly, when I ask this question, between a third and a half of the senior directors look at the floor. They put their heads down like that because they know there are things that they need to have a conversation about, but for various reasons, it's difficult. And, and my job as a facilitator is to get those conversations on the table before events force those situations on the table with a high level of potential risk and problems for the company. The second question is, what do you always discuss but never resolve? And the reaction here is about two thirds to a half smile at me because they all know there's things that that company is always discussing that hasn't found a way to resolve. And, and that's often an indication that you're up against one of those five paradoxes that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And, and the two secondary questions to these are, what spaces do you need to create in the organizations to have these conversations? I've never met a senior leader who's not busy, who's not on numerous committees, who isn't on lots of working groups, but for whatever reason, these groups are not providing the right space to have that conversation. And then secondly, what would be different in three years if these conversations led to the right actions? And these four questions can consume a group of senior leaders for an entire day. Um, as you can imagine, if there's a lot of things they need to talk about, um, this simple structure allows them to do that. But if you want to know more about these questions and more questions that you can use to facilitate these types of conversations that lead to a deeper understanding of purpose, please do look at that um, paper in Harvard Business Review. So what outcomes does this lead to? Um, and I want to just talk about two examples here that are, to me, give a real concrete insight into, in, into this. The first is CVS. CVS, for those of you who've traveled to the US, is a healthcare retailer. And a few years ago, they went through a process to understand what their purpose was. Um, and you can imagine they sharpened up their focus on healthcare. The problem was you could go and get prescription for a chest infection and buy cigarettes at the same time. And these two things were incongruent or in disagreement with each other for obvious reasons. So they took a decision to take tobacco products out of their stores. That cost them $2 billion across the top line of their business. So for me, this is material. This isn't a, uh, a corporate social responsibility. It isn't playing at the edges of a business. It has a material impact on the on the revenue and you have to go and to explain that to the financial markets but for them it was the right thing to do to align the business to increase employees motivation to increase the the trust with their stakeholders and the second was shell the oil and gas companies and i think these are some of the most interesting companies at the moment to observe um, both shell bp exxon chevron these companies are going through huge changes in terms of the activism of their shareholders this isn't activism from um, from environmental people this is shareholders who are demanding a lot more from them in terms of the speed at which they progress away from oil and gas and what you have here in this case study is just an i think an early stage example of where they disposed of certain operations at a, at a cost to them and then redeployed money into into green energy um, and you know i think if you look at what particularly bp are doing and bernard looney um, there it's very very interesting and if you look at the, the votes the shareholder votes that went through exxon and chevron um, about two months ago uh, where board members were voted out where strategies were not seen as being aggressive enough um, um, you can see real real changes being driven into the organization and it's about purpose it's about those questions um, and if you're not asking them shareholders are becoming increasingly assertive regulators are becoming increasingly assertive on behalf of tricky west bengal state council it is my privilege to have the second event of india at 75 this year our state council and our region, Eastern India, is focusing on business with the promise of a better planet, uh, a more equitable and sustainable business. Uh, today, we are delighted to have 
uh, Srini Nagarajan, who's the head, managing director and head of Asia of CDC. Uh, Srini and CDC have made many investments throughout South Asia, um, in Africa, uh, different states of India, and also has very closely observed the business practices in the eastern part of India, where most of our members today have joined from. And he will speak about how the opportunities of ethical, environmentally sustainable, and socially conscious business um, you know, has evolved and what it means for our country and our region. So there's nobody better to speak about it. Uh, Srini, thank you for making the time. And over Pleasure, thank you. Thank you, Rudra. And it's very nice to be a part of this, uh, uh, this event. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to the wider Fiki fraternity, especially to colleagues in the Eastern region of the country, uh, which is emerging and important for CDC as, as a development institution. Uh, the, uh, the Eastern and the Central Belt of the country is very critical for us uh, because more capital has to flow into those, those states which are emerging. This session is, uh, is to talk about responsible investing using the framework of how CDC as a world's oldest DFI uh, uh, you know, help deliver some of the most critical objectives around environmental, social and governance practices. When we introduced environmental, social, and governance practices some 20, 25 years back, it was, it was pretty alien to the country. And today it's becoming more significant to a company's uh, business planning and strategy. I think the business community's assumptions and plans and increasingly the, the international investors are shaped up by, by factors such as the private sector's role in sustainable development goals, the urgent need to address climate change, the social impacts of COVID-19 and addressing the inequality in the process and the momentum around diversity and inclusion, which is an important theme, which is also coming. We as CDC has have had extensive experience in helping our portfolio companies respond to these, to these entire business drivers and to develop and integrate best ESG practices. We work with companies to build their capabilities to better manage ESG risks and crucially to create business value at the same time, really. So this really strengthens the company's resilience and positions and positions them to be most impactful and most successful. Let me tell you, if you don't build a sustainability goal around your overall framework in the days to come, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to, to a, sustain as an organization in the medium to longer term and also attract international investors. We want to share with you, uh, share and encourage good practices across private sector, as well as developing a range of good practice guidance and even online tools, including the CDC's ESG toolkit, which is a free archive of digital resource tools and guidance available on our website, really. Looking at the coming decade, it is becoming clear that private sector must play a bigger role in addressing the urgent and significant developmental challenges particularly for ensuring sustainable food security in the world where our assumptions about food production are rapidly being challenged and changed by the realities of climate change. To address the social equity, which I talked about, and inclusion for billions who continue to live in poverty. So uh, this is not a session to promote CDC. This is a session for me, for, uh, for me to tell you as to how we look at and play our role in, as, 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 as a responsible ESG investor in creating a much better planet, really. So, um, uh, Nana, can you move into the next slide? I just, so what I thought I will do is give you a little bit of background about CDC. And as I said, this is not a session about CDC. This is a session about how to invest in sustainable development goals, really. Uh, we uh, Just a few slides about who we are, just to set the context. Uh, we are a UK government-owned development financial institution, the oldest DFI in the world. And uh, certainly I think uh, we invest British taxpayers' money in South Asia and Africa. And uh, essentially I think uh, we are committed to supporting private sector development. And, uh, and I think we bring in our experience over the last 70 years of running a DFI really. Um, and uh, we blend our commercial objectives and our developmental goals to make sure that we are able to invest in much more responsibly. And we never put our commercial objectives ahead of our developmental goals, really. Developmental goals for us stand much ahead of what we want to achieve as a DFI. Can you move into the next slide, please? 
Um, in terms of geographical reach, we are in 15 locations. We are in South Asia and Africa. Historically, we used to be in East Asia, China, Latin America, Caribbean, and many other countries. But over a period of time, we realized that more than one third of the world's poor people live in South Asia and Africa. And South Asia for us is all the SAR countries and Myanmar, and Africa is Cape to Cairo, all the 54 countries. So we recognize that capital is much more distinguished, relevant, and additive in these countries. And that's why we confined our geographies to these economies where we want to play the role of a true DFI. Development impact in a very true sense, we follow development impact in a very true sense, both in terms of what we mean and what we practice as well, really. Moving to the next slide now. Um, if you look at this, I think it just gives you a little bit of our portfolio. We are around $7.1 billion. Uh, we, we have an unlevered balance sheet, supported 1,195 business. In India, we have around 1.7 billion, currently is around $2 billion. And we invest in 67 countries. And, uh, and uh, I mean, we support more than 1,200 businesses globally. And it's, uh, it's a very focused operation between the two developing uh, you know, part, parts of the world. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, what do we really do? I think since we are a balance sheet investor, we provide patient and flexible capital and it's offered in many ways. We can invest in debt, equity or mezzanine products. And I think we also make sure that uh, we are able to strengthen our partnerships. See what South Asia, uh, particularly India requires is patient capital because I think we go through our whole, whole cycle. I mean, recently we went through a COVID cycle it was a very difficult time for many corporates to, to, to try and contend with it because cash flows were affected. I think the resilience of investors are, is very important to make sure that you're able to you know, tide over these cycles and stay with you. And if necessary, provide some amount of liquidity. We did provide liquidity some of our, into, to, to, to some of our investing companies during the COVID times because they're managing it very well. They're going through a temporary impasse. It's important that employees don't lose their jobs so it's important that we try and provide liquidity to them, really. Next slide, please. If you, um, if you try and look at the range of products which we have, equity, debt, trade finance, funds and capital partnerships and infrastructure, and the range of sectors we try and invest in, and uh, the, the, the minimum ticket size and the maximum ticket size, which you talk about in the debt and equity and fund investing, this really signifies three things. One, our capital is patient, it's flexible, as I said earlier, and we try and is horses for causes. We really tailor our solutions to what the business needs really. Um, and of course, each financial product is backed by investment professionals and impact specialists. And, um, and uh, we do have people under each product from development impact team, from the ENS team and the business and, and, the, and the business integrity team. And we blend those with the investing professionals so that we are able to find a fine balance between our development impact goals and our commercial objectives. And these are products which we use and um, it doesn't matter which product we use. I think the objective is to make sure it helps build a sustainable organization across these sectors, which I will go through in, in detail, really. Next slide, please. Um, if you try and look at what we are trying to do, really, we are trying to, uh, you know, in see, if you try and look at the whole world of, development impact. There are three main objectives I would put them under. One is inclusion. Inclusion is all about who are we reaching? Which segment of the population is our money catering to? That's very important. Second one is sustainable. Sustainability is all about what do we do to, to contribute to a greener planet and, and make sure that we are able to reduce the carbon emission having signed up to the Paris Accord. And being productive. Productive is to what extent are we addressing the biggest developmental needs and constraints to economic growth? How are we being catalytic to the markets? The whole objective here is to improve the realizations in the hands of producers and reduce the cost of services, right? We are, we, you know, so by the, by, the, by, the, by the very nature of the fact that we are a development institution, we really focus on these two themes. And technology is, 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 is a kind of an overlay we, which, which we try and make sure that it cuts across all the sectors. So if you look at the three cross-cutting cross themes I talked about, one is the climate change, which having signed up to Paris Accord is very important for us. Gender equality is very critical. Gender equality is what we have signed up to 2X challenge because gender as a topic 
is is still you know evolving in this country i would say i mean i sit on a number of boards i represent a, uh, my organization there's a lot of education needed in this as to why do we need gender neutrality why do we need gender neutrality at all levels not at just at the middle level and the junior level but at the senior level and at the board level as well and we are beginning to talk to certain organizations in africa we have set up what is called boardroom africa we are similarly trying to start a similar one in india the whole purpose behind these organizations is to identify women who can represent organizations at at very senior level and we have to create the next level of leadership in terms of bringing women to workforce because there's a lot of talent sitting there job quality and human capital are very important and i think we support our investment companies one of the things which see when you operate in emerging states uh, like the east of the country or the central part of the country uh, is i think there are three four things which are very critical one of the biggest missing links is perhaps you know the ability to attract talent talent is a very big thing and it's important that if you want to attract talent and retain talent you have to upskill people and skilling is a very important part of what we try and engage with our investee companies to do i'll give you some examples later and the second important point here is the path to profitability is longer right it takes time to scale these businesses up because the paying capacity is still building up in these markets really so we need a resilient investor to make sure that you don't expect overnight results in this it takes time really because but once you take time and you build the momentum it is sustainable and the third important thing is to make sure that we are able to bring in high quality entrepreneurs within our business integrity framework which is very critical for us uh and uh, so um we we you know we provide finance which most mainstream investors will probably be finding it difficult to serve really and that's when we mean that we don't crowd out private capital we crowd in private capital a mobilization theme is a very important part of what we do we are not here to substitute what a private private investors whether you call it commercial banks or private equity funds will do really we have to be more distinguished and that's what we try and do next next slide please um if you so this one talks about see uh, i mean the the overall the overall complexity i want to spend 2 minutes on climate change really if you look at the recent ipcc report the temperature it states that the temperature will reach 1.5 degrees uh, above 1850 to 1900 levels by by 2040 under all emission scenarios and human influence is very likely being the main driver um so looking at the urgency of the problem and looking at the pace at which it can really affect the gdp of the country over a period of time india being the third largest emitter in the country in the, in the world uh, we 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 focus a lot on climate change in fact 30% of our new investments are all coming in the aspect of climate change climate change is not just looked at through the lens of renewables alone we looked at it we 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 try and look at it across sectors so when we talk about net zero by 2050 investing in a net zero world because investment decisions which you take today affect the emissions tomorrow really just transition is a very big topic because on the climate change change side if you look at india is doing exceptionally well in terms of renewable energy it currently generates around 95 gigawatt but going up ambition of 175 gigawatt by 2025 but coal still represents something like 83% of the production and still and we are trying to transition the transition journey from coal into into uh, a you know a renewable atmosphere has got three main facets to it one is about the governance part of it really because the regulatory reforms as far as as far as the road map is concerned to transform people and the communities because you're going to displace a lot of people i mean coal if you look at the coal sector and indian railways is a major you know it it earns a lot of money for the indian railways which head then helps to subsidize passengers I mean, they employ what around six hundred thousand people. So, um, an infrastructure is very critical for this. CDC and the climate team we play a very critical role in this entire journey of of this of the, of this transition, and we have to do this transition over a period of time in order to save our planet. It's very critical, really. So, um, adaptation and resilience is also very important for us. Can you move on to the next slide, please? um we talk here about i mean uh, uh, this is i mean yesterday's announcement that cdc is planning to invest a billion dollar into climate related projects uh, the uk chancellor and the indian finance minister had a joint economic uh, dialogue in which that has appeared in the press today 
Uh, and uh, as I said, we invest 30% of our overall investment into climate related assets. And uh, in terms of our target sectors there, it will go across renewables, it will go across the various sectors, and uh, we'll cut across these sectors like food and, uh, you know, in, in food and agriculture, even construction and real estate, financial services, many responsible manufacturing. If every sector, we have to start looking at it through the lens of climate. That is the only way we can save this planet. And every responsible citizen of this world have to do this role. I think this is very important for all the future generations which are, which are, which are, which are to come. And this is extremely critical for us. And anything, coal is a complete no-no for us. And of course, even gas, we don't do this. I mean, unless and otherwise it's inevitable for some, some economy, smaller economies like Congo in Africa, we might try and do this, but generally we say no to gas. So most of the international investors are moving in that direction and we are definitely committed to moving in that direction. Next slide, Naina. So um, I talked about the, 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 the net zero map I think where we are different in the way we try and work um, than, than uh, many others, uh, a lot of others are also trying to do this. We set up environmental and social committee in every company we invest. And this committee is perhaps a subcommittee of the board where a couple of board members are also involved in this. This committee completely threadbare analyzes the sustainability agenda. Sustainability agenda is, is very crucial. It requires education. It requires making sure that the risk management team of, of the company understands what this is. It also requires the fact that it requires additional capital expenditure. How do you contend with it? And should you take the capital expenditure in the long-term interest of the company? But the, it, the messaging is very clear. If you don't adhere to the, 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 the sustainable development goals and the climate change aspects of it, your ability to raise any international capital is dwindling. And I think it's very important that we try and recognize this, but more so, as I said earlier, as citizens of the country, we do have a responsibility towards this, really. I'll just start by saying that you were talking about, you know, broadly about climate change, the impact of climate change, uh, inequality and gender. As a business person who might be listening, uh, what would you say for Eastern India? You know, where are we? You know, what is stalling us from taking the right steps? You know, you've looked at many of our companies in this region. Where are we? Are we too short term? Is there not enough capital? Do we not have the knowledge or the talent? What should we be looking at as business people? First of all, I would like to commend the people of West Bengal, really. Uh, I mean, this is, Rudra, I think we must realize that this is a journey. This is not an overnight change, which you, you can switch something off tomorrow and then say, tomorrow I want to operate this way. This is a journey. The journey includes three, four things. One, the journey includes certain amount of capital expenditure, right? It's important that you want to transition to this. The journey includes conviction with the board and the management team that we want to make this a part of our mainstream, really, right? It's very important. That's where the ESG committees play a very critical role in the whole exercise. The third important thing here is that I think it should be measurable. Whatever steps you take should be completely measurable. And uh, it should, because I think the more, I mean, for example, Securities and Exchange Board of India said the top thousand companies in the country today should disclose what, what their ESG policies are and what kind of a change they are making. And uh, I mean, I, I also, one other thing I would say here is that there should be, you know, we should, yeah. like this town hall events, what we are trying to do now, there should be more town hall events within Calcutta city, as, as an example I'm saying, of entrepreneurs coming together and really understanding what is climate change? What should we be doing towards this from the point of view of being responsible investing? The value of sustainability report so precious in the world today. I mean, financially speaking, I mean, beyond our responsible investing, I'm saying even financially speaking, there is a lot of international investors who are looking for sustainable companies today, which are well-governed. Most of us in corporate India have at least heard of the concept, but there's still a, a lot of ambiguity around, you know, how ESG targets are to be set. Uh, and there's also recognition that these could vary from industry to industry. So I was wondering if you could speak to your experience in really goal setting and promoting change in your investing companies on ESG parameters. Uh, in particular, do you sort of benchmark what you see in these companies with their own past, or does CDC have a, 
a sort of framework and a sense of benchmark against perhaps global uh, best in class? Uh, how do you actually approach target setting and persuading these companies to uh, engage and to change? Thank you, Mugan. That's a good question, actually. Uh, we do have, uh, I mean, so let, let me start by saying when you look at our new impact framework, which I described about here, yeah, that's the reason why what we have done is we have gone into a new impact framework today uh, in terms of the way in which we try and measure uh, the way, uh, you know, how, how we try and measure ourselves against the scale of inclusive, productive, and sustainable. As I talked about earlier, inclusive is who we are reaching. Sustainable is to what extent are we are we building a greener planet? Productive is to what how are we addressing the biggest needs, and in terms of catalyzing markets, the combination of I S and P makes your total impact score. Right, in CDC, every every opportunity which we look at, we measure it against a certain scale and say, is it meeting our objective of a certain scale, certain score which we want to achieve? Right, if it doesn't achieve that score then we don't take it forward at all because there is no need for our capital. If it achieves the score, then we take it forward. And I think the second important point is, the, as I said earlier, it's a journey. We have to handhold with people. I mean, governance is not something which we can build overnight. Yeah, You talk about introducing the best practices in terms of anti-money laundering, anti-bribery, broad basing the board, building the governance standards and framework around it to make sure that the organization runs a bit more formally. It takes time. It's a journey which we try and do. Similarly, I think on the uh, on the overall productive side as well, it takes time. So every opportunity which we, against the ISP framework, which we have built, we, we, we try and measure it so that we understand as an organization, what kind of scores are we really achieve, achieving? Now, in terms of the underlying companies itself, really, um, so that's the premise under which we start our journey, right? And I think before we get into any company, we would have done a thorough analysis on the development impact side. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started. We have already more than 95 people. Can you see TK on the screen? Actually, let me just, I switched off my video for a second okay, okay, okay. before the presentation starts. Okay, okay. No, I just uh, was, didn't want to welcome you and then, uh, fine. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the third edition uh, of India at 75 from uh, FIKI West Bengal State Council. Uh, we had the first one on purpose. The second one was an ESG. And this one is a discussion on technology and the impact of technology on business in India and in rest, rest of the world. It is my great honor to welcome Mr. TK Kurian from Prem Invest uh, to speak to us on how the world is going to grapple with technology, take advantage of technology, what should be our concerns. 
and how we can use this period when we are using you know, this remote working environment uh, at business you know, for our social lives uh, to leapfrog uh, as a country in the use uh, of technology. Uh, I don't think I have to introduce TK to many of you. He heads Prem Invest. He used to be the vice chairman of Bipro. He you know, speaks about technology, business, and in investing with a social impact and social uh, uh, you know, uh, footprint in various places. And he's invested in various companies, which I hope he will touch upon and you know, what he has learned and what we could learn from it. It's uh, great to have him at the field. For giving me this opportunity. And what I'll do is that I'll just run you past, for about 20, 25 minutes, I'll run a few slides, which give you a sense of the impact that technology has had in the world. And, uh, you know, the disruption that we think that we're seeing today, it began in a very different place about 300 years ago. And this slide in a way reflects that. So if you really look at this slide, what it tells you is that prior to the 16th century, growth was a really a function of population size. When we go back and talk about how India and China were really big, big contributors to the global GDP, that is true. But we also had a huge number of people here. And we, were an economy that's primarily dependent upon agriculture. So if you go back and look at the reasons why the Portuguese came here, why the British came here, why the Arabs came here before that, it was all to manage the spice trade. But if you look at the growth from first century AD to 1600, global growth really was, was at the CAGR of about 0.07%. Then in the 18th century, something very strange happened. What happened was that uh, end of 18th, beginning of ninth, I mean, beginning of 18th century, the invention of the steam engine in a way suddenly got communities, communities together. So communication became much, much faster and people got much, much closer. And then along with the engine, with the with a steam engine that was used to drive all kinds of machines. It started off with a spinning machine. And in 1840, there was a big revolution, big movement in, in the UK called the Luddites who went around destroying machines because these machines were taking away jobs. And that continued. So in a way, what happened with technology was there was also massive disruption that happened. Funnily enough, the number of jobs, absolute number of people who were employed actually came down. Surprising, the, surprisingly, the value add and productivity per person actually jumped. And between 1600 and 1900, world GDP grew six times at a CAGR of 0.6%. So look at the gap, 0.07 to 0.6. Then came what we now call the second industrial revolution in the 20th century. This was primarily driven by basic sciences. Chemistry became a big science. Physics became a big science. If you look at most of what we know today in terms of basic sciences, a large part of it was what we are working off today is what was discovered then. The world economy at that time from 1900 to 1950, grew 3x with a 2% CAGR. And in between, just remember, we had two world wars. And labor productivity improved substantially. It was up about 60%. Post 1950, when the first computers came into the workforce, what we saw was that from there on till 2015, the world GDP grew 12 times at a CAGR of 3.9%. So the three numbers to kind of really think about is a 0.7, it is 
your 0 0.6, 2, and last of all, 3.9. So basically what we did from 1950 onwards till now, pretty much is much, much more than what's been done for the 2000 years before that. So this just gives you a sense of how much technology has kind of brought in, in into the world in terms of productivity and value add. Let me quickly go to the next slide. Sorry, this is becoming a little bit of a pain, sorry. We are now in what is called as the fourth industrial revolution. And this is expected to create value up to $3.7 trillion. And what's happening is that, you know, what we are seeing now, initially, if you look at the period from 50s to 2015, it was single technology that kind of actually drove the change. Right now, what we are seeing is there are multiple waves of innovation happening in every possible field, starting from biotech to artificial intelligence, to chemistry, to materials, every part of, of what we know as the value chain is getting disrupted. The second big chain that we're seeing here is no longer is growth linear. Growth in a way is exponential. And I'll touch upon this as we go along because successful companies of the future, especially those who deal with tech, are primarily companies that think exponential. If the market is growing typically by 10%, you're a market share leader if you grow 11%. Thinking exponential means how do we grow 100%? So that's the kind of thinking that needs to come in in every business leader, especially when tech becomes part of the mainstream. Because if you don't think about it, somebody else is going to be thinking about it. The other piece with technology is the rapid pace of diffusion. You know, if you just look at the way, and I'll come to it a little later, in terms of how quickly mobile phones have kind of assimilated into the workforce and into, the, into our daily life. A refrigerator took 50 years for it to actually become a part of daily life. A mobile phone took 10. And then if you go back and look at the biggest component here, which is the last point there, economies who invest heavily in people are going to be the key beneficiaries of this particular revolution. The command and control structure in which governments work, in which enterprises work, in which companies get created, those are giving way to more trust-based structures. And if you look at the slide on the right-hand side, which gives you my right, which gives you a sense of what is happening out there, you would find that the investments in intangibles have actually gone up. Tangible assets today are getting more and more shared. Intangible is where the differentiator comes in. Let's go to the next slide. I talked about this a little bit. This slide on the left gives you the time taken for technologies to achieve different penetration levels in the US. And it just shows you how quickly, if you look at internet, if you look at the time scale, which is on the X axis, and the number of US households, which is on the Y axis, if you look at internet, which is on the right hand side, the cell phone, which is on the right, and internet, which is again, the one before that, the line, it's almost an exponential curve. It's a straight line curve up. So it took 30 years for electricity and 25 years for telephones to reach 10% adoption. But it took tablet devices less than five years to hit a 10% adoption rate. Smartphones, for example, hit 40% penetration in 10 years. So that's the kind of scale of change that you're seeing today. 
And the biggest takeaway is this, that the consumers of today are people who are born using technology. Surprisingly, decision-making still lies in the hands of the digitally native. I mean, knife, knife, sorry. I think that's the key differentiator. So if you go back to the previous takeaway, the command and control economy, which is all about getting decisions in the top. The fact that if you were older, an older person, you had more knowledge. That's no longer true as it's being replaced really by more diffusion of decision-making out there in the front, in the hands of the people who can make it quickly, take decisions and change the decisions based upon what they see real time. I think that's the fundamental change that we're seeing today in terms of structures. And the way tech is playing a role to actually disrupt this. Let's go down to India for a minute. So if you look at us today as a country, you know, we are extremely lucky as a country because we don't necessarily have to go through the many uh, disruption that technology has caused in older economies. We can pick up stuff that is new and use it. Diffusion will happen at the same pace. The biggest issue that we today have is our, our societal structures and our organizational structures, and to some extent our governmental structures are stuck in the past. So if you go back and look at the value that it can add, we think that about 700 to $900 billion of value can be actually unlocked through alignment of all these different constituents to achieve certain core areas that we believe this huge amount of benefit. So if you look at core digital technologies, new digitizing sectors, and digital and government markets and labor markets, these are broadly how it's been split. So in the middle, which is the new digital sectors, a lot of work has been done in terms of financial services. And some very, very good work has been done. And this has been done primarily because both the private sector and the government came together. The same thing can be used in healthcare, which remains a massive need, in education, in retail, in agriculture, all across. So we believe equal pools of knowledge, of, of knowledge and equal pools of opportunity lie for us to go and disrupt these sectors just by getting people to work together. And in a way, what has happened is that venture capitalists from across the world have kind of seen this. And if you look at the investment in the first half of 21, it's close to about $17 billion. And uh, in 22, we've already kind of attracted $23 billion in FDI. So just, just gives you a sense of the belief that people have in our country's ability to come together to solve a problem. So many people might think it's naive, but when you go back and see the, see the results, it's not a broad-based result at all. But for the first time, we see first-generation entrepreneurs coming into this business who are not stuck by the dogmas of the past, who really want to go out there and do something which is unique and who are extremely well-funded to achieve their ambition. I think that's the kind of framework that this current era kind of gives you. This just gives you a sense of how, you know, if you look at technology, and this is a landing page that we have there of Chase Manhattan Bank. And if you look at the way Chase Manhattan is being slowly kind of unbundled by every component in the US with, um, by Amazon, you can get a sense of how easy it is for a disruptor to come in and walk off with profitable chunks of business in a bank. And the beauty of this kind of a model is the more customers you get, the more scalable it is. So it's an eminently scalable model. And uh, the beauty again here of this is that 
the old companies who are playing in this game, if they don't change, very soon they'll get stuck by the unprofitable components of the business that they have to run because they're a utility, while the more profitable components would go to these kind of guys. And the paradigm by itself has changed. If you look at how long it took to amp for Amazon to actually do well in its business or actually show any kind of operating profit, it took them all the way from you know, close to about 25 years to get here. And all the time, they were extremely well-funded because they were basically selling a story of the future. So I think for all of us, there's a lesson here. Amazon is one example. But for all of us in startups, I think the biggest example that we have to think about it is that today, if you have a vision for the future, you're able to lay it out. There is enough money across the world and even in India that'll, ch that'll chase you to make sure that you're successful. Of course, perennial unprofitability is not something that somebody's underwriting to, but the real ability to go out there and disrupt markets is a key component here. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, we, are, we were early investors in Flipkart. And when we invested in Flipkart, nobody actually believed Flipkart would do well. In fact, we used to get, we used to get kind of, uh, you know, called out as guys who invested in a book selling business. At the end of the day, when we exited the business, a business that we had invested in less than, I think, 500 million, we finally left at 20 billion. That's the kind of value that we got out of the business. And we persisted. Similarly, we are in another company called Policy Bazaar, which is going to go IPO right now. So I won't comment on that. There, but we came in at a value of close to about 150 million when it was just a concept. Similarly with Lenskart. So there are a bunch of these companies out of India that really are coming up to be global players. Lenskart is now all across Southeast Asia. Very soon they'll be in Dubai and, uh, in, and also in the Middle East. And they believe that this model is eminently scalable across because now they're really building world-class capacity to disrupt the best of the best in this game. So it's a question of kind of getting your dreams together, getting the funding behind it, and making sure that you remain razor sharp on execution. I think that's the key to it here. If I go to the next chart, this is on the industrial sector. And you know, I'll talk about a little later when it comes to the auto industry in spe specifically. But one of the big, we are sitting in the, in the heart of one of the biggest disruptions that's going around right now in the 100-year-old vehicle industry with EVs coming in. And with EVs coming in, we believe there are a whole bunch of new services that you can build on top. You add autonomous vehicles, the software layer onto the EV, and then suddenly what happens is you can now envisage a world where if you want to overtake somebody, you can pay the guy money for having kind of step by and let your autonomous vehicle go through. So the kind of services that you can create around this is of a completely different scale. Just to take a more mundane example, if you look at you know, uh, leasing, leasing can now become you can start paying your lease rentals, not by how much it costs to run the, to own the vehicle, but based upon how much you run. Similarly, if, you, if somebody runs away with your vehicle, you can, let, you can immobilize the vehicle remotely if you're a finance company without necessarily having to get collecting agents chasing the vehicle somewhere in town. So those are the kind of new services that are going to come up. So if you look at all the new technology changes that are coming up in this particular area, I think the biggest disruption that's gonna happen is there's gonna be a service layer that's gonna be built on top. That's gonna to completely kind of create a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of opportunities in terms of new services that you can kind of render to the same guys. So those are the kind of opportunities. So the, the focus is moving more from the hardware layer and the sheet metal and the hard metal areas that you talked about in the past back into the software layer, which you can create and which you can interface with almost seamlessly to create a new economic paradigm. Uh, 
you know, how do we equip our next generation to be innovative, more innovative? Because the way I'm seeing this, it's really uh, a winner takes all kind of uh, economy that is coming. You know, if, if, if one guy comes with a great idea, he's going to take over majority of the industry. So how do we make our next generation more innovative? And, you know, do we need to have structured innovation at primary, secondary, tertiary education levels? So, you know, it's, uh, it's a very good question. So let me answer this in a different way. I think, you know, the tools of capital, which is money, people, that's resources. Those are the kind of tools that typically Adam Smith defined when he talked about the five forms of capital. You had land, you had, you know, cap capital in terms of monetary capital, you had intellectual capital, you had a whole bunch of these things. I think what we could really do is help people. Uh, one is getting ideas up and help people to kind of make sure that they were able to access those ideas and implement those ideas quickly. In this business, you can't afford to wait. And I think from a society perspective, <clears throat> we as a country don't accept failures very easily. In the US, failures are a part of life. <clears throat> in fact, you know, the folks that we employ in the US have got two or three people who who run several businesses have been very successful. But if you talk to them, they'll tell you, well, you know, I did five businesses, three of them worked very well, two of them failed. And they have no issue with that. <clears throat> In our, we, as a culture, we tend to hide failure. And I think the ability to learn from failure and to work on it is a key skill that we need to kind of give our people. <clears throat> and second is, I think we need to really look at our educational system. Our educational system is still a very, you know, it's based upon Taylor's production methods. So you have stages from one to 12 as in a manufacturing line. At the end of one year, you look at one and you say pass or fail. End of year two, you say line, second station, you say pass or fail. That's how it works. <clears throat> and I think what has to happen is that has to get, we don't necessarily have to go back to books. But creativity starts at a very early age. And everybody has creativity in them. So recently, for example, one of my colleagues was telling me that, you know, he's got a kid in the US in uh, second grade. And his class teacher basically told him, can you come and make a presentation to us because we're having an innovation class. So he was shocked. He couldn't understand what innovation meant. So this colleague mine lands up there and uh, there are these kids who are making a presentation on how to raise money from VCs and this is at that age <clears throat> so in a way what happens is the tools that will make them successful I think we need to kind of imbibe those tools in them at a fairly early age and we don't do that most of us what happens is that we land up at the end and we tried after we finish all our degrees we are half tired and exhausted at that time, you know, we decide now here is the time to get innovative. Very few people break out of the chain. 